Okay, well, everyone, welcome to the March 1st, 2022 Finance Committee meeting. Um, I'm required to tell you this meeting is being audio and video recorded. I am the chair, uh, Rachel Maori, with Vice Chair Marianne Lafarge and committee members, Councillor Stan Moulton and President Jim Nash. Um, so let me tell you, let's see. We have um, public comment is, is welcome as always. I would um, encourage folks who want to speak to a particular agenda item to wait for that agenda item, which um, for example, the Cook Avenue uh, facility agenda item is the first one up after approval of the minutes. And that's where I was gonna open it up, the floor up for, for folks to speak to that specific agenda item. You are welcome to speak now on any subject um, but I, I would encourage you, if that's why you're here, to, to wait just a few minutes and I'll open it up the floor again. Um, so do we have anyone who would like to speak now for public comment? Oh, wait, let's see. Are we, oh, no, I'm sorry. We're doing roll call first. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. Um, Councillor Maori. Here. Councillor Labarge. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. And Councillor Moulton. Here. Okay. So we have a quorum. I'm just going to look and see if there's anyone who would prefer to speak now. It looks like we have Tracy Atwood. Um, and just a just a preface, I you know I encourage people to be succinct, but I'm not going to time um, comments tonight. And also after the agenda item, after the counselors have spoken. Um, we we will um, I will open up the floor again for for some questions or uh, interaction with counselors with the public. So uh, with that said, Tracy, would you like to speak now? No, I'd like to wait for the um, okay. agenda item to come okay. up. Okay, yeah, it should be pretty fast. Um, okay, let's see. I think that's um, yes, but I, yeah, okay. So why don't we begin and folks can start raising their hands um, for the agenda to speak at the agenda item and, get, and then we'll stack the order. Okay, so first we have the approval of uh, minutes from the previous meeting, minutes of the February 8th, January 12th organizational meeting. Move to approve the minutes of February 8th, 2022 and January 12th, 2022. Second. Uh, Laura. Oh, yeah. I was just gonna say, Councilor Nash brought to my attention a scrivener's error and I will make okay. that correction. Oh, I didn't catch that. Okay. I didn't <laughs> okay. Um, are there any? Is there any more discussion on the minutes? If not, we can uh, have a roll call. Mm -hmm. roll. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay. Minutes approved. And so here we are, our five financial order, 20, um, <clears throat> excuse me, A, 2020, uh, excuse me, 22.025 in order to acquire property located at 196 Cook Avenue, referred by city council at the 217.22 meeting. Um, does anyone feel like we need to, uh, do any of the committee members feel that I should, would like me to read it again or? You're feeling up, or perhaps, um, let me just see. Councilor Mayor. Committee members. Any of my committee, oh yes, um, Councilor Nash. Well, I, I think um, it would be good to hear from the mayor and um, uh, any city administrators who'd like to present or frame, you know, what this proposal is about. So you think, um, I'm just trying to think logistically, before before um, opening up to public comment, is that your? Yes, it, let let's get the item on the floor and the proposals, um, and you know have it properly framed, and then and then yeah, I I I think um, let's let's hear what people have to say, their questions and their concerns and their ideas. Um, okay, um, that I I can hear that. Uh, let's see. Let me just try to. So in terms of um, the mayor's office, is there anyone, um, Director Fiden or Mayor Shara, who would like to say? 
So both Director Fiden and I are here. Okay. Good evening. Um, good evening. Um, so you know, I I feel like we've we've sort of framed this before, and I uh, are you? Can you hear me? Okay. I was actually having trouble hearing you, but you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, but maybe I'll turn my. Let also. Um, they turn off the heat in City Hall, so I have a space heater on. So if that's too loud, let me know. I'll turn it off. Um, we'll fall asleep. <laughs> um, so, you know, we have needed an animal control facility for a very long time. Um, you know, the, the council has appropriated funds in the past. So in 2018, um, the uh, there was $425,000 appropriated from the capital improvement plan. Um, and the city worked very hard to identify a location and wasn't able to for a few years. Um, in 2021, so just less than a year ago, uh, the project came forward again for another location of city owned land. And city officials asked Berkshire Design to give them an idea of the cost based on the schematic that they were working with. And they estimated it would be, could be as much as $750,000 so, um, so the council, a lot of councilors that are here tonight, um, you know, appropriated another four hundred thousand dollars. So that was last April, um, and there was a really extensive conversation about this project then, uh, including in, um, I believe it was city services um, with uh, you, Councilor Maori and Councilor Labarge and um, Councilor Foster. Um, a very extensive conversation actually in July, so even more recently, um, with uh, Shayla Howe, the animal control officer, about the, the sort of extreme need that we have for this facility. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I can go over it a bit again, but we went over it the other day. You know, we're in a very unstable situation with uh, Amherst, where we have been springing some dogs. Um, they don't always agree to contract with us. There are many dogs that they won't accept. Um, and, you know, pregnant dogs, dogs with any sort of aggression, dogs that have any fleas. There's really a lot of dogs that we're not able to bring there. Uh, additionally, if a stray, if we have, if a stray comes to us through the ACO, um, the ACO picks up a stray, we, often aren't going to take that dog over to Amherst because what happens very often, this is a, you know, the best scenario, right? Is that we, there, a stray comes into our possession and um, then the owner is, comes home from work later that day and, um, and then calls and gets reunited with their dog. So, uh, so generally that dog would just sort of be kept at the police department um, yeah. in the station because yeah. uh, it doesn't make sense to go you know bring it over there and then and and then there'd be a certain time where then someone couldn't be reunited with their dog at that point and they would have to wait till the next day so um, so it's a very difficult unstable situation that we have um, you know we've had contracts with other uh, kennels um, there was a situation that worked during sort of the beginning of COVID when um, places that board dogs suddenly had no business and were desperately looking for business, but now that situation has changed. And so we really end up relying on um, the generosity of people in the community, our vet clinics to help us out um, and just kind of stashing animals where we can. And that's not a tenable situation. It's um, it does it certainly doesn't uh, fit any of the requirements that we have and any of sort of our legal responsibilities. Um, so it's just it's not a situation that that works now. It certainly can't be um, a longer term solution for us. So we're in desperate need of of a facility. Um, you know, we showed you some pictures of where animals kind of get stashed all around the police department, including cats. That's another thing is that not all, you know, Amherst does not accept cats. Very few of these places will accept cats and we get a lot of cats. Um, so, you know, we need somewhere where we can, um, where we can keep cats that isn't, uh, you know, an unheated um, bay of the police station where uh, vehicles are fixed. So, um, so that's sort of the, the background of the need. Um, and, you know, we have, as I said, we've looked for, for many, 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 many years and looked at 
dozens of locations. Um, you know, our goal is is always to um, use land that's already municipally owned, and that's been our priority. And really, the reason so this order, you know, this is just an order to acquire this land. Um, and the reason that we're interested in purchasing this land is that we we do think that this is sort of a a lovely opportunity to um, have an added benefit of being able to uh, preserve um, this, this access to this really key conservation area of the city, Broadbrook, Fitzgerald Lake Greenway, and you know, preserve some of the parking there that, um, for that access that people clearly utilize and enjoy. And, um, and so you know, we, we think that that's an important, it's an important added benefit that makes this uh, location a really good possibility. Um, this is not the first time this location has been looked at. It's actually been discussed for this purpose for years and years and years, and um, and actually had you know was brought up last summer as a possibility. But it's at this time where it's kind of at a place where uh, we feel like the price is something that we um, feel would be reasonable for the city to to uh, acquire for that added benefit of having that access to uh, Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake. So. Um, that's some of the background. I don't know if uh, Director Fiden has other things he wants to add or other other things you want us to sort of give as, um, you know, to lay the groundwork, but, you know, obviously we've, uh, we've talked about this a lot, so I know that I'm not telling you all stuff you haven't heard, so. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to shout out to Chris, who, who put in the chat that they need to raise their hand and can't, so I will, I will note, I will note, Chris, that you want to speak, and I will put you in the line there. Um, and also, I think we should probably actually uh, turn off the chat. But um, so if you can't, when it comes time for uh, to speak, if you can't um, raise your hand virtually with the, you know, uh, then then please raise your hand physically, and I will um, Laura and I will scour um, the boxes and make sure to to look for you. Um, yes, it, the director Fiden, uh, did you have anything you wanted to add? Just, just very briefly, so my only part of this is really helping with the real estate search. The city has looked at a lot of sites. Um, the, the reason this site is particularly attractive is um, that, you know, in, in laying it out, we know we can lay out the, the section of the animal control facility, which would house dogs, which is the part that concerns people. Um, three, we can keep it 300 feet from any home. Um, that makes it further than, frankly, most places in the city, unless you're on, you know, dirt road in the middle of the woods. So we can do the separation. The topography helps us on this site. Um, so there's a lot of benefits for this site in particular, besides the fact that it's close to downtown. We're spending less time for ACOs driving around. Um, but I think the key from us is that we can mitigate the impacts on a residential neighborhood nearby. Okay. So committee members, yes, Councillor Nash. Thank you, Councillor Miori. Um, so two <laughs> quick questions. Um, so as somebody who's parked there to walk on into um, the, the trails there to Fitzgerald Lake, so, Everybody who parks there now is technically trespassing. Is that correct? <laughs> because we don't own the property or do we have permission? Do folks have permission to park there? So there's no formal permission. We own a, I believe it's a 24 foot wide right of way, but I have to look that up. So right. like when I park, I squeeze as far to the right as possible because I'm sensitive. Um, the land is not posted no trespassing and the owners certainly know it's happening. So we don't have any formal permission, but they know they could put up no trespassing signs if they want to, they haven't so far, but obviously they're motivated to sell and the next owner of the property may not have the same standards that they do. So a big benefit for folks would be that people who access Fit Fitzgerald Lake could have a, uh, a, a parking area that they wouldn't be possibly trespassed from and it would have a, a surface that wouldn't be um, like the one we were on the other day where it's muddy and, um, uh, and lots of water. And yeah, so it, it, it is the proposal for a blacktop surface or maybe a crushed stone? 
or it would definitely be a hard surface. Our experience is, you know, you think crushed stones, other things are more permeable, but they're really not. The ground's just as tough. So it'd be some sort of hard surface, you know, concrete, asphalt, pavers, that would be a later design of this. But okay. we'd want something you could clear snow from and crush rock is difficult to clear snow from. Thank you. And one more follow-up question um, or related question is, are we considering, I, I know the ACO is going to be in charge of this facility. Are we considering volunteers or community members to be part of helping out here? I, I just say that because I, I know the Franklin County Dog Shelter is very much, depend, it, it, it's lovingly run by a, a, a group of volunteers who are really dedicated and that um, uh, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there um, in terms of the, one of the concerns is that animals that are um, distressed are the ones who are gonna bark the most and, and, and be the most disruptive. And when there's uh, folks on the site who uh, really care about the, the, the animal, that um, that would help with that particular issue. And, you know, I think it matches our values that we would wanna have, um, the, you know, these dogs well cared for. I, I'm just wondering if that's been thought of and if it hasn't, if it could be considered. Um, Volunteers. I, you know, I'm, certainly things could be considered. You know, one of the commitments that we've sort of made when we've talked about this project in the past is that this actually isn't a building that's open to the public, which is, you know, there's been concerns about people kind of coming in and out and that this would be sort of like a building that people are just going into regularly. And one of the things that we've really committed to is that it's, it's really not. And there's just, there, you won't see a lot of activity there. Um, so, you know, I wanna keep that in mind that that's something that certainly has been said by the city before. Um, that being said, you know, if, if that's a model that works, any, you know, I, I would certainly be open to considering it. I don't know if that would be the best thing for this facility. Um, and, you know, these, I know in the past it had been talked about a sort of a standard thing for these kind of facilities is that inside, you know, there is, there are cameras that are watching the dogs or their, their motion or sound triggered. And so um, the tabs are being kept on the animals to make sure that they're okay. And yep. if there's something that needs to be addressed, someone would come out and, and um, you know, and help whatever animal was in distress. So it's not like they would just sort of, no one would know that something was happening. Um, they right. would be, uh, you know, the ACO would be alerted that something was going on there. Well, that is my expectation, Mayor. And I'm, 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 it's just been my experience that, um, you know, is helping people find opportunities to uh, explore careers working with animals. I know that Dakin cannot, they have to turn away people that, because people really want to, you know, help, you know, animals that have been lost or, you know, need care. And I'm just throwing that resource out there that could be a way to uh, involve the community here. So anyway. That's, thank you. I mean, I think that's a lovely suggestion. I mean, the other thing is that, you know, uh, there often won't be animals there or there might be one, you know, it's, it's right. not like if we could have a set volunteer shift and guarantee that someone would have something to work on. Sometimes there would be, you know, as we've said, one or two dogs, um, some cats, sometimes there wouldn't be. But um, so if someone could was available more on call, that might work more. I don't know if we could, it would really make sense for a sort of a, a regular schedule. I, I understand. So, but thank you for considering. Um, Councilor Moulton. Uh, yes, thank you. I have a number of questions, some of which have been uh, passed on by constituents, but at this point, I'm going to defer those uh, so we can hear first from the public, unless Councilor Barge has anything she'd like to ask right now. Want to ask me what? No, Councilor Barge, I was just saying I'm going to defer to the public. I'd like to hear from the public at this point, unless you have anything you'd like to ask immediately. No, nope, that's fine. I agree with that. And then I'll speak later. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, this is what I, I think. Um, why don't we um, open it up uh, for public comment? And then we can um, 
we can discuss and have residents ask questions or follow up comments, but I would like those comments to be directed to me and I will distribute them and ask um, the, the mayor or Director Fiden if, um, if, you know, if they um, can answer those because uh, sometimes department heads have to leave. So really the question should be directed at the committee members. Um, so let's, with that said, let's uh, see what we have here. So Tracy, uh, Tracy Atwood, you're first in line. Hi. Hi, good evening. Um, so I'm Tracy Culver and I live in okay. Florence. Um, Councilor Nash mentioned that Franklin County has a regional animal control facility at Turner's Falls. And that facility is supported by the surrounding towns. Currently, Amherst has an existing animal control facility that is underused. And because the use of microchips is becoming the norm, the underuse will continue with the dogs. Northampton appears to have actually a minimal need to shelter animals. So the obvious choice from a financial perspective is to designate the existing Amherst facility as a regional resource open to Northampton and other Hampshire County towns. Building a new facility in a contested residential neighborhood to the tune of close to a million dollars makes no financial sense. We'll have a facility with all the ongoing costs associated with any business, but there is no business. Where is the income to cover overhead and maintenance costs? If this unnecessary facility will be totally subsidized by our tax dollars, all Northampton residents should have a chance to vote on it. So I ask why we wouldn't look at Amherst as a regional facility as making the most sense, not just for Northampton, but for Hampshire County as a whole. Thank you. I muted myself. Thank you, Tracy. Let's see, up again, let's see, we have Michael um, Keston. Are you there, Michael? Sorry about that. Um, no, no, no worries. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to wait if other people want to speak first. I spoke at the city council meeting. I've, I've sent emails to all you folks. So that's okay. It's your time. I, um, I'm just looking. There's not that many people um, with their hands up. I know Chris wants to speak. So, oh, and I see Kim. So there's not, I, I think, Michael, if you'd like to say um, okay. some words, that's, that's fine. That's good. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody here. Um, really appreciate the civility and the open mindedness of everybody. And uh, I think Tracy said some things excellently, much better than I will say them. But again, the economics, if, if you go to the Hadley Pet Hotel, their VIP, their top of the line kennel charge is $72 a night. So let's take that and amplify that up to $200 a night for Northampton to put a dog up there or a similar facility. So 72 multiplied multiple times. That means for the nearly $1 million we're going to pay just to get the door open on the new kennel, we could put a dog up in VIP status for 13.7 years with no labor charges, no upkeep, no liability insurance, no maintenance, etc. So that's that's one point. Um, again, repair staffing has been a problem, I know, with the animal control officer department, uh, utilities, lights, and then, we, of course, we have problems with the neighbors. And much like Franklin County has a regional facility, so that town A is all not, town A is all set, but then town B, the next town over, doesn't have to build their own facility. All the towns cooperate. I would assume they share costs staffing, all those kind of things. Northampton doesn't have a facility, but what about Williamsburg? Or what about uh, Hadley? What about all these towns? If we were to cooperate, create a regional facility, either the one that exists in Amherst or a brand new one, I would support a kennel someplace. It would also open up the number of op the, the land available to consider could be more of a remote facility, thus not heading steamrolling towards annoying all of the neighbors who are already upset before this facility has even been off the ground. Um, I would like to see this land, this little special piece of land, which is the entrance to the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area, which we all know and love, 
put into permanent conservation. Uh, I would be happy to open up my own wallet and help pay for that outcome. I think something cooperative between the city having some skin in the game, private individuals, and perhaps some organization, I won't name names because I don't speak for them, but we all know which people uh, uh, have some funds, uh, which organizations have some funds and might be willing to say, oh, we'll put in a third or a quarter or something or somehow help uh, with the process. And I would love to know specifically what are the terms when we, when Northampton does put a dog in Hadley or Northampton, what is the contract cost? What is the per dog per night cost, et cetera? And then there is scant details and data about how many dogs have been put up and all that there. Uh, um, so if, if we, I keep hearing, well, there'll be many nights when there won't be dogs in this facility. So then we're going to spend three quarters of a million dollars to build a facility that will be not that used. Something seems inconsistent here. So the economics, the potential disturbance to the neighbors, um, building a regional facility, those, those are my main points. Thank you so much for listening. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I'm going to let Chris speak, and then um, Kim L. You can go after that. Thank you. Is Chris here? Hi. Yes. Hi. Can you hear Great. me? Hi. Hi. Yes. Uh, my name is Christine Clark, and um, for the past almost a month now, uh, myself and all the neighbors have pulled together in trying to get our voices heard. And quite frankly, we don't feel like we're getting heard at all. We've come up with all the reasons why we don't want this in our backyard. Um, and we did the petition that we handed to you uh, the other day in which 55 residents, uh, homes in the area were, were canvassed. Out of that 52 residents responded, 44 are in opposition of this kennel. They do not want this in the area for numerous reasons that we've presented to you. And, and eight, uh, were unwilling to sign, some were no, some had sent letters to you with their answers. Um, and my concern is that we're, we're, we're presenting our side of the story and, and it just seems like you're passing right over us. There's been no consideration for our property values. And um, after speaking with a couple of realtors, they've told me that yes, your property will go down in value because you'll have this cement concrete dog barking kennel in the backyard. Um, and that's concerning to me. It's, it's, it hasn't even come out of any of your lips that that is even a concern of yours when you're talking about putting this kennel in our backyard. This is 300 feet from my bedroom window. And it's, and it, it's, it's not ethical. We're not being heard. And it, it just blows my mind that you're just talking right into paving it. And we haven't even discussed how it's affecting the neighbors here. And that's very concerning to me. I, I just, uh, my father was a councilman and he would be flipping in his grave right now if, if he witnessed what I was going through. I haven't slept, none of us. We have been pooling together. This petition took a lot of work. I had a very interesting conversation with the animal control officer. And she uh, implied that there has been no statistics held for the past couple of years that she can come up with. But she did interestingly tell me that since Christmas, she has had one stray dog, two surrenders, and one cat. Since Christmas, she's had one stray dog and two surrenders. And again, you're spending three quarters of a million dollars of taxpayer money to put up a facility that I don't feel is necessary. And I don't think it should be put in anybody's backyard. There's got to be another way to come to a, 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 a mutual agreement where the neighbors um, you know are aren't going to have this in their backyard if you want if you're so hell-bent on getting this kennel put up for one stray dog every three months I, I just think that it's not appropriate uh, we don't know anything about it we think that maybe it's going to go here oh but there's rocks behind that and the sound might bounce we don't know and indoor kennels, outdoor kennels. It, we know nothing about it. You're, you're just plowing right through to getting the money and doing it. And there's no buildup. We have no idea of how it's going to be paid for. Yearly cost. 
it, it just seems like we're, you're so far ahead of the game and you're not listening to us. And I, I really hope that that petition speaks volumes. Um, and we're just gonna continue to fight. It's absolutely mind blowing to me that this is what we as neighbors have to do. Um, it, it's almost, it, it really hurts. It, it's, it's, it hurts my heart that this is how, this is how politics are. Anyway, on that, I'll say thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let's see, um, Kim L is next. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. My name's Kimberly Lambert and I live on Pines Edge Drive. I've lived here for 30 years. So I know a bit about the history of the Moose Lodge and the activity levels that have taken place there. Um, right now I'm doing a survey, a random survey of how many cars are in the parking lot on a daily basis at different times. Um, first, I, I'd like to know when, the, when this group will answer our questions that we have presented today and also at the past meetings. Um, and one important thing that I don't understand is what is this process? Okay, you had your first reading at the city council after a site visit, I believe. Then uh, Councillor Jarrett had a great brainstorm and we did a sound check. That was a site visit. Now you're in the finance committee and then this Thursday, it goes for a second reading. What is the process? Nobody has told us, and we've asked, what is the process? How many more readings? Do the readings get stopped at some point? Um, does it go back to the Finance Committee again? When does it go to the Conservation Commission? And what questions can be asked there? What role does the Conservation Commission have in this? Um, and then when do, where does it go after that? So how many readings will this have? Could you please answer that tonight? Um, we need to know what the process is. Uh, when does this, yeah, when does it go to the Conservation Commission? And, and nobody at the beginning of this meeting until now mentioned that we delivered a petition to you yesterday. That's pretty important. The citizens are speaking to you and you're not like, I agree with Chris, you're, you're not even addressing that. We're re making requests and we have some needs here and you're just sort of going right over it and talking business as usual. You have a plan and you're gonna make that plan happen. I, I, it must be really frustrating to have looked at all these different sites and you just can't find one that fits, that works, but this is not the site. This is a residential neighborhood. What about the DPW, that little dip down on Route 9 between the, uh, the uh, right after the DPW, across from the Smith Folk? What, what's, why isn't that a spot? Um, and I'm really concerned about the, the data that you, you're basing a major spending decision on some pretty limited data, very limited data. Um, you don't have any information there on how many dogs were microchipped that did not require overnights. You don't have any information on um, how many hours dogs spent overnight, exactly exact number of dogs for each individual overnight. You only have three months of data and it looks a little bit haphazardly pulled together. Um, how many hours that each dog spent there? You know, you're gonna make a decision about spending a lot of our money based on very scanty data. I'd like to see you review the data tonight and question the data, look at it seriously because there is a graph, but it's not very descriptive. It's not very precise. Um, I say make this conservation land and keep looking. Make that trade, make that land trade, go ahead. Good idea. 
but keep looking for a new place, not in our residential neighborhood, please. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Let's see. Um, Jeff Friedman. Hey, thanks so much. I'm sorry I got to the meeting a little bit late. Um, uh, I'm a local school teacher who was a little tired after two days back to school. Um, but uh, my wife, Michelle, and I live uh, right next door. We're at 164 Cook Avenue, right next door. Uh, the, um, the proposed siting for the animal control facility. And um, I've written some emails and I, I wanna say, I appreciate people's responses from some counselors, uh, from, from Wayne. Um, and, uh, you know, I appreciate the diligence that people are putting into being thoughtful about this or trying to be thoughtful about it and to hear from residents. Um, <clears throat> I want to say thank you to Wayne and others. One of the things that we treasure about where we live is this incredible Northampton treasure, I would say, uh, the Fitzgerald Lake uh, Conservation Area. And, and so many, I, I, you know, I, I, I can only speak for myself, but I see the hundreds of people, I don't know the actual statistics, but probably hundreds of people a day who seek um, solace and respite in this um, treasure uh, that, uh, that is, is part of Northampton's, uh, you know, conservation uh, ethic and demonstrates our, uh, the city's commitment to, um, purchasing uh, and, and for perpetuity, a conservation land. So I, I just applaud Wayne and others who over the years have helped sort of expand that into this incredible treasure. And I, I'm still befuddled about the logic, which I, I can't see yet. I just don't understand the logic of why this animal control facility would be sited here adjacent to a residential neighborhood. I, so I'm gonna reiterate some of the things other people have said, I'm gonna to try to be as terse as possible. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I do wonder is there are dozens of people every day, myself included, who take our leashed uh, dog into the woods. And I just wonder, I don't know enough about animal behavior, but I wonder, so dozens of people coming a day, parking their car, or as we do, we walk our leashed dog up, and, and now there are potentially gonna be some animals in, I don't wanna call it cages or whatever, partition spaces or something, animals sense other animals. And I would imagine that the animals that are, uh, that are parked there, albeit temporarily, could be, uh, they'll, they'll sense, they'll smell, they'll hear, they'll hear other dogs that are being walked and, uh, and uh, they'll obviously start barking. And, and then as the animals get walked away, they'll eventually stop barking. Uh, but depending upon how you cite the facility, um, they're going to sense those dogs there that are being walked. I don't know if that agitates animals. That certainly excites them. I don't know if that agitates them, but I just wonder the logic of, of all places to cite some animals that are being sheltered, albeit temporarily, to have it right where dozens of people every day are walking their dogs. It just kind of scratch my head. Um, I do wonder, um, and, and I, uh, what Kim was, uh, I'm going to reiterate what Kim said, what exactly is the process? I'm an optimist eternally. I'm a teacher. I'm eternally optimistic. Um, is this sort of a done deal? And, and you guys are being very gracious to give us time to sort of, uh, you know, talk and, and vent our feelings and, and frustrations and, and curiosity. But, you know, is it already a done deal that this is happening or is or could the city say, you know what, maybe it seems like on second thought, we've done our due diligence, but maybe this isn't the best place for it. I'm just, I'm, I wonder. Uh, and I, so I specifically would like to know, and, and I think I got at least a partial response today, the industrial park, for example, or some properties along uh, North King or some place that's sort of closer to the perpetual highway noise or that's far removed from residents like in the in the industrial park. I don't know enough about the process for the city potentially getting property there, but I just think that would be far away from um, from uh, residences. So, um, and again, I, I come back, to, I'm gonna read it reiterate what Michael Keston did well, uh, sort of looking at the economics and scratching your head almost, you know, three quarters of a million dollars. Um, it just seems 
just an extraordinary amount of money to spend uh, on, on a facility that's gonna be parked uh, where it is. So I think I'm gonna stop at that point. Thank you for letting me drone on here. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, let's see, I don't, let me just check for other hands and then we could start getting some questions answered. Let me see, oh, uh, let's see, I believe we have a couple more hands. Um, Adrian, Adrian? Um, yes. Hi. Um, hard act to follow with the astute commentary, but I was going to say also, um, and what I said to, I think, Wade, um, when we had the sound test the other day or yesterday. Um, in terms of the North King uh, uh, strip as a possible site. Um, and also, I may not be as articulate as others who've spoken, but it does seem that it is an inordinate expenditure of taxpayer dollars to build um, this facility when, um, uh, you know, even it may be needed. I'm not really convinced myself that for the sparse population that's projected to inhabit this um, kennel, that it's, it's really, um, again, as I said last meeting, um, a cost benefit analysis. The benefit, uh, the cost far outweighs the benefit. And especially if there are other options, even if it is Amherst, or even if it were decided to have um, a Amherst be a regional site. And if Amherst also will not accept certain dogs, um, pregnancy or fleas or, or, you know, aggression or whatever, would those same kind of dogs be acceptable in this site um, that, that is, um, uh, being postulated to build and um, the need uh, may be great. I'm not convinced, but it may be great. And to have autonomy for Northampton and how it takes care of lost or strayed animals. But there was a wonderful, and this is sort of an aside, but I think it, it um, ties into the finances of the city and the, the students um, of the, um, uh, it was in the Gazette, the Northampton Youth Commission wrote a wonderful uh, column, but in essence, they say, the sheer number of people who are left without a home to return to and a bed to sleep in night after night, coupled with Northampton's currently insufficient infrastructure to provide urgently needed relief has created an abysmal situation. So I think, you know, uh, investing more than a quarter of a million when it's all, when it all would be said and done um, uh, the human factor to, to house or provide housing, and I know that's a big undertaking, for those who are, are sleeping in tents or um, who are unsheltered. So again, financially, it might be a, 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 a more productive, perhaps, um, to alleviate the suffering of some human beings um, for whatever reason they may be in the situation they're in um, uh, than an expenditure for, again, of what things would be a sparsely populated um, animal control facility. And also, uh, I was at the, the noise test and um, the recorded dog barking is not gonna be the same as actual live dogs barking. Um, and um, and even then, it could still be heard behind the um, the most impacted uh, building in this condominium community. So again, that's um, that's all I can add to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. I only have one, um, Allison. 
that's high. Um, and would, um, and Allison, would you make, uh, would you tell us your, your oh. road or town? I've been, people have been doing it naturally, but I should have. Uh, Sorry. Yes, that. I know. Um, my name is Allison Berryman, and I live on Pines Edge Drive in Northampton. Also, um, I am also curious about the process of um, sort of this whole the whole process of it going to city council last a couple, two weeks ago um, and sort of where we go from here. And again, reiterating what Jeff was saying about, is this a done deal? Is this, um, I, it, it, I feel like from what I've been hearing is that um, the purchase, this meeting right now is about the purchase of the land. Um, and then with the intention of it being used as the, as the um, animal control facility. Um, so I just, I, maybe some clarification on that and the process in sort of what are next steps moving forward um, or things being halted. Um, I want to support my, I live sort of farther into the condominium community, um, but I support the people who live in the building that it will be adjacent to and their level of distress and concern about having this facility um, built there. I also wonder what is the financial, is there a financial impact that will be happening to the taxpayers um, as this facility is built and up and running and has that been looked at and explored. Um, and I also really appreciate the suggestion of looking and exploring maybe at a regional, thinking of this um, in, on a regional level um, with shared expenses between other towns um, and maybe a location that does not sit in a residential community. Um, it, it's, it's hard for people to look at, say Google Maps and look at our community and say, it's surrounded by woods. There's nobody around. This is an ideal location. When the reality is anybody who I have brought to visit or see is like, wow, that's really close to a lot, a number of residents. And I think we've been speaking clearly about our are not wanting this to happen. And I do have to agree that it feels like it's been glossed over. Um, so I, I appreciate the time that we have been allowed to speak and look forward to hearing responses and continuing on this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, so Kim Lambert, you still have your hand up. Uh, because you spoke, um, we, we, I, I would like to open the floor up again for comments and questions, but I, I think uh, this would be a good place to pause and maybe start answering some of the questions that have been uh, put before us. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then, then I will, um, and then we can, and then we can come back to you. Uh, okay. I was just thinking my suggestion would be maybe perhaps that President Nash could, uh, could could go through the, the process in council and perhaps um, Director Fiden could, and I'm interested, you know, this, I, I know the council process, but Director Fiden could address, a, you know, uh, a little bit of the process um, with, the, with the land and, and that. So why don't, why don't we start there? President Nash, would you like to give a council overview of this agenda item? Yeah, Where's sure, thank Where's you. Going? Thank you, that was, uh, that was a, a fair question. So, um, uh, items typically come to us like financial orders like this. Uh, we do an introduction at a meeting like we did two weeks ago. And then at the second meeting, we decide whether or not to move forward with that item. Um, in the case of this uh, particular uh, financial order, um, we, uh, we definitely heard that people were concerned about this particular um, uh, proposal. Um, we arranged for a site visit, and we also arranged for this meeting here for people to provide comment. The, um, the, the second reading 
of the of the item will be this Thursday. It'll be on the agenda, and council has the opportunity to make a decision that night. Um, I'm I'm not sure where council will go, um, but um, it there's there's a chance that it it could be approved on Thursday night, um, but. There's also a possibility that uh, further discussion, further uh, research needs to be done and um, we could go that way as well. Um, so that's that's the layout. Typically, um, yeah, it's, it's, so if you're worried, if you're thinking, where is this going? Right now it, it, it's, it's heading towards a discussion for approval on Thursday night. Um, I'll just add President Ash. So generally at finance, yeah, we um, generally either neutrally, negatively, or positively uh, recommend as a as committee members make a recommendation that is then discussed at full council. Full council has no obligation to to um, you know follow whatever we say, but that the, a possibility coming out of tonight would be a recommendation from the the, the four councilors who are here, the committee members. Um, to full council, and so at full council on Thursday, we will we'll go over our reasoning. If, if we do vote, you know, if we have make a recommendation of some sort, uh, yeah, okay, does that sound good? And let's see. So, Director Fiden, perhaps you could answer the question of the process with the land. I'm curious too. Um, you know, if this is something that we can purchase the land. Is, are those decisions tied, like the purchasing of the land and the facility? Would we purchase the land without the facility? That kind of thing. I'm sure. Um, let me let me start with the search. And I came somewhat late to the party. This was sort of started by the last mayor, the ACOs, and Central Services. I got involved um, because I. I do buy open space for the city, and I'm typically buying a typical year about 100, 120, 150 acres of land a year. So I sort of watch the market carefully, and, and the mayor, you know, basically said, you know, look for sites as you as you're doing that work. The last mayor and the, the current mayor as well. So I don't know all the detailed sites they looked at. I know a few things that might help a little bit. One is if the noise of a animal control facility was disturbing, it would be disturbing to residential uses and disturbing to business uses. Right? We don't necessarily want to lose businesses any more than we want to lose housing. So the search that we've been doing has been looking for a site that's relatively flat, so you have less the bowl effect for noise, and a search that you could be at least 250 feet away from a sense of receptor, a business, a home. In this case, we could get the dog part of this to be at least 300 feet away. So meeting that setback requirement in most business districts would be very difficult because of the separation. And of course, the nature of commercial, not necessarily industrial, but the nature of commercial districts in Northampton is they're relatively thin, right? We have a lot of housing downtown on King Street, it's close to residential neighborhoods. So it's not that are obvious sites, you know, there's some, you know, we did look at the National Grid facility. It doesn't work. There's not enough space there. Um, and they're not selling land anyway. Um, so it's not that there's that many sites. And, you know, and fewer of those sites are on the market in the first place. So we approached this as saying, wherever we go, can we do a site with, you know, no impacts on neighbors or, you know, virtually no impacts on neighbors? Um, so that's sort of how we started looking. Um, some sites, I, and I wasn't involved, so I don't know all the details, but looking at the Hampshire County Jail, I know there were logistics issues of negotiating a lease, and I wasn't part of that. I know David Pomerantz said one of the concerns was if we got state approval, it might end up being a regional facility that might be even noisier. I mean, you know, regional facilities, everybody wants a regional facility in a different town, but they don't necessarily want a regional facility in their own town because then you're magnifying the effects. And of course, Amherst, you know, it, a few people mentioned the Amherst as a regional facility. It doesn't allow cats. It doesn't, you know, it's not, doesn't work for dogs that are only in our custody for six hours. Um, so some of the things that we would use a city, a site that the city owns are different than a site we would use far away. 
So we looked at a lot of the sites, some of the sites and, and only some of these came up tonight. Some of the specific sites people have thrown out, you know, industrial park doesn't really have available land. The one large parcel you see of the industrial park is wetlands. Um, most of the properties have been developed, or all the other properties have been developed, except that large wetland site, which isn't workable. People have thrown up the state hospital. Land is protected forever as open space, it is protected with so many protections, it's virtually impossible to take out of that process. It, it, open space is designed not to be easier to, to preserve, you know, to develop that land. So people have talked about the, um, the Smith Oak lease land, the state hospital, all those things wouldn't work. The land on uh, Locust Street, the zone mission was DPW. That's actually owned by the state. It's the old state um, highway facility. Um, it was, has its materials. It was it basically, it's listed in the Registry of Deeds as a capped landfill. Um, and, you know, we wouldn't, to, to touch a landfill um, is a big deal because we don't want to expose the materials underneath it. Um, there's a little bit of area in front, and I know DPWs looked at that for a future recycling center. I don't know where that is, but most of that site is, as I say, the cap land. But that's where you see the all the work that was done cleaning it up, cleaned up some of the waste near the surface, but basically encapsulated the waste. So it's still there. So you know, we we have been carefully looking at sites all over the city. Um, there's obviously lots of wooded land around, but most of it has exactly the same issue as this site. You know, we are. You know, the city now owns 25% of the city as open space, which is wonderful, but it means the same comments you hear about, oh, we don't want to be next to Fitzgerald Lake, is going to show up in a lot of places. You know, it's either near Fitzgerald Lake, or it's near Parsons Brook, or it's near Salmon Hills, or it's near Mineral Hills, and there's housing there. And so we want a place that's isolated, but again, we, that we can ad address all those concerns. Um, the order, and, and as to Council Mayor's last question, you know, the orders before Council is specifically for an animal control facility. I think I mentioned to Council, you know, as the person who's charged with protecting open space, it's not that I ever object to open space, but, you know, the cost of the site, which is a bargain for developable land, we could do an animal control facility, would be incredibly expensive for. Um, open space. And the reality for us is there's literally a thousand acres of land that's higher in our priority list. So if council, you know, council wanted to spend $100,000 preserving this open space, fine with me. But if, if council wrote me a check for $100,000, this would be pretty high, pretty low on the list compared to pristine parcels all over the city. So it, it doesn't show up that high. All right. Thank you. If I turn my my camera off, it's only because of um, intermittent. It's not uh, <laughs> not commentary. Um, oh, let's see. Um, uh, Councillor Labarge and then Councillor Moulton. Um, yeah. Thank you, Wayne. I have um, some questions for you, please. Is this a hi, Wayne? Wayne, the Moose Lodge, looking at the website, real estate website, it was up for sale, I think it was what, 462,900. It's off the market now. Do you know why it might be off the market now? I don't know why it's not formally listed. I know that they have been trying to sell it, you know, they, they bought it as investment. They never planned to keep it forever. They've been trying to sell it. They've certainly been happy to talk to us for the last decade and been happy to talk to other people. So whether it's list or not, I don't know, but certainly if you call them up, they're interested in selling. So if you have been apparently talking and working with them, you did not know that it was off the market? I, again, it's on the market. I mean, I, I think what you're referring to, Counselor, is are they listing with a broker? And I can't comment on that. I've never dealt with a broker. I've dealt with them directly. Okay. But I know that they are interested in So we have a signed option if council votes. So our option means they're committed to sell to us, but we're not committed to buy to them. Okay. Um, so if council votes, this goes back to the process. If council votes and if the mayor so directs, 
we would go ahead and buy this property. But if either council doesn't vote or the mayor doesn't so direct, we wouldn't buy it. And it's our decision. At this point, they are committed to us for a certain time period. Okay, so Wayne, you did mention about working with them closely of doing kind of like a switch. We go into the Moose Lodge, correct? And the city is apparently giving them a lot, a building lot, correct? So practically what you said is absolutely correct. Legally, technically it's different. We don't swap land. That's not an option for municipalities. Um, we have an option to purchase this property. We advertise as a unique purchase because it serves some specific unique needs, those being a good place for animal control facility and parking for Fitzgerald Lake. That lets us buy the property. And we advertise for sale and we're open, prepared to open multiple bids, a lot we have on Woodland Drive, they bid on that property. So yes, it will feel that way. We'll go to closing, we'll sell them one lot and buy another lot, but it's legally two different transactions. That's why we need this vote from the council. So you're technically making an appropriation of $100,000, but practically we're going to sell the Woodland Drive property. We're gonna get $100,000, we're gonna deposit that, one second later, we're going to write them a check for $100,000. Okay, um, how much land is on that woodland property? I'd have to look it up. It's the nature of an acre, three quarters of an acre, something like that. Okay, and at the Moose Lodge, how many acres is on, on how much is on that one like, Wayne? Again, I don't have it at my fingertips, Councillor. I can look it up. It's, you know, it's five acres, seven acres-ish. I'd have to look up the exact number. But remember, a lot of that is wetland, so much that's not, doesn't have much value from a market standpoint. Okay. So I'm just curious because I saw that it was up for sale for 462900 and something. And then all of a sudden, it's off. Yeah. Don't Completely answer. off the market. So I had some people calling me about that also. So I, I needed some help with this to find out what was going on. If you knew what was going on here, did somebody buy that property already? Yeah, so, so they're bound to sell to us if we exercise that within a time period. And, and frankly, Councillor, we typically ignore the values that people think it's worth because it's worth, you know, we can't legally pay more than property is worth. So regardless of what someone lists property for, you know, our offer is based at, on what it's worth. I mean, that's why we've been talking to them for a decade. It's only now that we think their price is reasonable, that we're prepared to do something. Okay. And I, I have some more questions, Wayne. Here we have the, it's conservation. We have the trails there. What we saw at the first meeting we had and hearing the neighbors complaining about unleashed dogs, okay? And we did see it with our own eyes. It happened that day. I was shocked to see what I saw. Cars pulling in and opening up their car doors and the dogs not leashed and just running, running up to the trails. The last car that came in, a red vehicle, four cars unleashed, shooting right off by the side of the, um, the lodge into the trail. And we had one person who said he actually got bit by an unleashed dog. Now, I am gonna talk, not as a city councilor right now, as a family that have been dog lovers all our lives, okay? Nobody's gonna tell me about dogs. And I'm hoping I can get my camera on this so I can show you what we did as a family. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, this is a Russian Wolfhound. It's a boyzoy, not a cheap dog. But our dog had won many, many championships. Championships. I didn't show them. We had these, this dog flown out by the best handlers around the country, all right? I, we have met many, many people 
who breed different kind of dogs. And this last one here, he's one of the best trainers at one point way back around the country. Also Shetland Sheepdogs. We didn't breed those, but we bought them and they were shown by trainers. I have a problem, Wayne. When I am hearing that there are monitors in the building at nighttime watching the animals, okay? I don't care how many monitors are running. I'm gonna tell by experience. With this Russian wolfhound, perfectly healthy, three months later after she won her championship, my son Chris and mother, something's happening to Abigail. She's breathing funny, funny. I came and looked at her and I said, oh my God, I put her head on my lap. So I'm just giving you some experience here. I said, Chris, call our vet immediately. She died 10 minutes later into cardiac arrest. I wanna know with these monitors, all right, here we have a dog patrol officer, one or two during the night, I cannot answer to that. How far do they live from here? When you have a dog under stress, under stress, it makes a difference where you live and how fast you get there to help that dog who's under stress. I have a problem. That's my big problem with this situation here. Nobody being there, not knowing how long it's going to take them to get there. I mean, our patrol dog officers, they have to sleep like every other human being. And to say to me that videos are going to be going all night long, who's watching them? Is it our police department? That's a question I have here. I am very unsettled about dogs being left by themselves, by themselves in a cage, in a cage. And ours was not in a cage. And it happened just like that. So at nighttime, our dogs, my dog, okay, our, we have a Australian cattle dog, which is a herding dog. And when I heard the decimals at that meeting, uh-uh, I heard a small little, little bark. And then I heard a little medium bark. And then another one. I do not agree with that decimal that was being used. And I have my reasons for that. I'd like you to come up with that decimal. I will put our Australian cattle dog out there and you'll see what it's like with our neighbors around here. It was much different than what you were showing, Wayne. They have a deep bark. Also too, if we have, like we do get dogs that are loose and going through the backs of our yards, my neighbors next door too, they have golden retrievers and they show them so that they can, they travel all over the country with their golden retrievers. We have all kinds of wildlife. You don't think when our dogs are out there, they're not gonna bark, they bark. And you can hear those barks. Our neighbors can hear our dogs bark. We can hear their dogs bark over on Lady Slipper Lane. So I'm not happy about that, this shelter even being put there, Wayne. I really feel with the experience of knowing so many people who show dogs, have dogs, they are part of our lives and they need to be treated with respect and dignity, just like everybody else. To leave them alone, I have a problem with that. To put them in back to somebody's backyard, I have a problem with that. Not knowing who's gonna be there, who's gonna watch them. And also I did hear tonight, which is absolutely true, when you have dogs, no matter where they are, I mean, one of my counselors could bring their dog over and come out and bat, and their dog is going to smell that ground. And they will urinate some of them. And this is going to happen there at that site also. Believe me, it will happen. 
So am I comfortable about this? I'm not. I'm not. And I have my reasons why. Because of spending a lot of money all our lives as family and showing dogs all over the country of what can happen to a dog. We were home with our dog. When you're leaving a dog by itself, I have a problem with that can go under stress for some reason and you don't know and how long it's going to take. I also have been told today that with our dog control officer, which I did ask her in community um, city service, if she was still doing Williamsburg. I've been told on her website, she is still handling the dogs in Williamsburg. So why don't we look at going regional way and getting these outside West Hampton, wherever, all together, come together, work together. I have taxpayers calling me, complaining about this kind of money, and why is the city always looking at behind residential? And I know it's been difficult, Wayne. It's been difficult for our mayors previously of finding sites. But I think the state property, which I did talk to you a week ago, that I think the state really should be sitting down with you, with our mayor. And I think they need to open the doors like they did with the property at, at the Northampton State Hospital. That's always been owned by the state. We open the doors. We have development in there. They can't give us a small piece to go ahead and put a small shelter up there. I have a problem with that one. And yes, I agree with you, Wayne, about up by the jail, up on the hill, of the legality parts of that, that could be a problem. And I'm glad you mentioned that to me. But I feel that there's still state property off of Pertzbit Road, open field, that I think we all need to work together. And I know that the state, State Rep Lindsay Sabadosa, our senators, they would step in and try to help us here, get a small piece so we can put that shelter up. That, that's my feelings with this, Wayne. Thank you, Councilor. I, I think you raised some really good issues. So let me just try to address them maybe in, in three boxes. One is, you know, I, I can't comment on ACO staffing. I'm not involved with that. But I can say that some of the points you raised are exactly why the ACOs want this facility. I mean, having some dogs in Amherst, having some dogs in a cage in the police department bay, having some dogs who are foster adopt means that some of those dogs are not getting the love and attention they should get. Um, and it means that the ACO time is really divided. So, I mean, part of the motivation is to free up more ACO time to have the dogs in one place and not having them on the road and juggling many areas. And frankly, you know, you heard people's comments about not having numbers. One of the reasons there's not numbers is because the dogs are all over the place. You know, a police officer picks up a dog and it goes in a cage in the basement of the police station for a few hours, never goes into the ACO's hands. They don't have ability to track it because they never saw that dog. It's, you know, it, it, we have this sort of shotgun approach that, I mean, I'm not a dog owner now, but as a former dog owner, I think it is a concern. Um, so the idea of this is to have better facilities that are not, you know, cages in the basement where you hear police vehicles, but are designed specifically around the dog's needs in mind. One of the reasons the site is expensive is having separation between dogs and cats and having isolation facilities and having the abilities to give the dogs the, the quality of care that they need. Um, I, I, in terms of the noise issue, I, I just want to make sure you all remember the charge we had from, from city council was to put the noise at the volume it would be outside the building. So nobody's questioning what, what you said, Councillor. Absolutely. When a dog is barking, it's louder than what you heard in the site visit. But that wasn't our charge. Our charge was, what's the sound on the outside of the building um, with relatively little insulation um, and then the distance from there. And then the, the final thing is the only land the state still owns on Burks Pit Road that's not permanently protected as open space is the jail. Everything else, you or your predecessors in council worked with us to tie up that state land 
in as many mechanisms as possible. You got legislation through to protect this open space. Mm -hmm. It's subject to Article 97, which keeps open space. The city holds an agriculture preservation restraint. So we basically protected and double protected and triple protected that land because we wanted to guarantee to the Hampton taxpayers that all that state hospital land will be protected forever. But in doing that and making that guarantee, we also lose the ability to unprotect it for any other uses. So why don't we think of taking some of that money at that $100,000 and keep it as conservation? What is, is the clock ticking, Wayne? That's my big question here. It, it is, is ticking. I'd have to look it up. I can, I, can, I can do that when somebody else is talking and tell you exactly how long yeah, the option is. I would appreciate is. that, please. Um, but, but again, I mean, Council, we're, we're looking at four separate acquisitions in your ward. We're looking at acquisitions in every ward in the city. So if Council makes the pie bigger, Mayor makes the pie bigger, sure, we can buy more land. But there are other properties that are far more valuable that are more threat. So again, you know, I'm never opposed to conservation properties, but this has less ecological value than other properties. I understand that, Wayne. I mean, if we look at Pine Grove, I mean, that was worth the money. It's absolutely beautiful. And it's costing money to go ahead and reconstruct that and get that land back to its natural way. So, but anyways, you've heard what I feel about it. And I still feel that there is a way, and I think regional is a very good way to go. And I think combining with each other, and I think last year, I could be wrong, but I think we had heard, there was a letter sent, I think, to the mayor and to city council in regards to, I, I don't know if it was the SPCA in Northampton or not. I got to look at my website and see if I can find that letter that they were very willing to come in with Northampton and work with them. And I can't remember who the organization was. It was some vet locally here that was very willing to work with Northampton. So I'm just wondering, are we reaching out there right with our own vets here in Northampton? Um, Another question. Can I weigh in a little bit? So it, those that was not a group that that are veterinarians. I don't believe. Um, you remember that, Gina Louise? What that letter? I, was. Yeah, I I do. Um, that you know. So he, we, as a municipality, have certain legal obligations to the animals that we're picking up, and so any facility that we're building, we would have to you know have sort of control over that because those are our you know we are obligated to serve. Right our, our uh, community. Um, you know, I just wanted to talk about, so, so the, as I said, these animals would be monitored if, but I wanna make sure you understand if an animal's ill, they wouldn't be left alone in this facility. They would go, you know, as I've said, we, we have good relationships with the, with the vet clinics in the area. Um, we lean on them extremely heavily now, not just for animals that are ill, but because we don't have places to put animals. Um, so, but if, if, if there was an animal that had some sort of medical issue, it would not be left alone um, in- I'm talking about a quick thing. You never know when a dog mayor is going to have a blood clot in their heart or whatever. And that's what happened to our show dog. Had an embolism in her heart and it killed her within, it was almost like seven to eight minutes. That's, so that's my I'm question. Very sorry. Um, I mean, that, you know- But my question is, Mayor, yeah. I understand we do need a facility, but if you've got that letter, because I think we're, we do have people here in the city who are professional, who are veterans, who are very willing to work with the city. And I don't know why we're not attempting to do this. Again, those were not, I don't believe those were veterinarians. Um, do you remember? I can't remember. who. Yeah. Was. So um I don't believe those were veterinarians, but again, we, you know, we have an animal control officer. And so we need to care for the animals in our care. Um, and I think, you know, what, what a private organization wants to do is, is great, but that's not what we're looking at um, here. Uh, and so just, you know, again, I just want to sort of remind counselors, there's been a lot of talk about the cost, um, which I understand can be 
surprising, but the, you know, the money, the council has already appropriated all of the, these funds. Right. This is, this order is about purchasing this land. So um, the council has already agreed to that, to fund this needed facility at that amount. Um, so, you know, I, I understand it's a discussion point, but I just wanted to make that that point to council that, you know, we've had this discussion now of many years and have, we have approved this funding or uh, I say we, because I was part of the council um, over, you know, in, in these two separate times um, already. Oh, okay, let's uh, let's um, do a round with some um, other committee members and then um, we can see if the residents have any further comments and questions. Um, yeah, Councilor Moulton. Thank you. Um, Director Feiden, can you address two of the other questions that were raised earlier? One is what involvement, if any, will the Conservation Commission have in uh, permitting the uh, location of the animal control facility at this property? And secondly, has a private partnership, a private public partnership uh, been considered to raise the $100,000 uh, for preserving this as conservation land? So I guess that the first question first, um, the, a portion of the site is wetlands, a portion of the site is buffer to wetlands, which means any work requires a, a permit from the Conservation Commission. Um, we've done an assessment, so we, as part of our due diligence, we will be pulling back the impact on the wetlands. Um, so we're reasonably optimistic that that would be an, a good permit to get because we'd be having less impact than today, but we would absolutely need to have a a permit before the conservation commission and, and that um, would come and, and excuse me that would come after city council approval of the appropriation that's correct yeah right so we're, we're, we're trying to typically we, we've done this a lot and, and for both this council and the last council you've seen this for a few times for affordable housing we tend to sort of do a, a go no go you know is something doable then we go to city council and then we spend money you know, it's expensive on to do that to put together a permit application so we don't do that till we know that this is a, a viable site going forward. Um, we do a lot of fundraising. Um, I have constant letters from the Ethics Commission because we're very careful about how do we do fundraising in a legal way. Um, and uh, we haven't done fundraising for this site as open space. Um, most of our nonprofit partners help us with logistics and help apply for grants, but they don't have their own funding and they've been made whole at the end of the day. The primary source for open space is state grants, private donations, city CPA. Um, and again, this site would not score particularly well for open space. I'll give an example. We just purchased 25 acres of land um, about a quarter of mile north from this property. Beautiful piece of land, beaver ponds, wonderful trails, uh -huh. incredibly beautiful property. We applied for it and did not get a state grant. Um, state grants are very competitive. You really need to show why you stand out. Um, and so here's a prop the other property um, with all its frontage on a beaver pond and all its diversity still wasn't good enough to get funding for, for a state grant. Um, uh, community fundraising, certainly you heard someone on the call today who, who'd contribute. We, we do a lot of fundraising, but it's a similar thing. You know, that it's a limited pool. So if you're fundraising for one site, you're not fundraising for something else. And we tend to get some donations from neighbors um, and we get donations from people who are just interested in open space. Again, I say we're, I'm very aggressive. I'm really proud of our fundraising fees, um, but this would not score very well compared to other properties for, for anything. Some people would contribute. Um, and again, as I said, not that I'm opposed to his open space, but it's always to the extent that things where can't do something different, that's difficult. There are some other properties, for example, on Boggy Meadow Road, north of this site. They are far more important ecologically. There are islands in the middle of our conservation area. Um, it's hard not to say those are more important parcels. Any other follow-up questions? Or... Uh, no, I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll wait. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, President Nash, do you have any comments or questions? No, I think I'm good for now. 
Okay, I'm going to ask a few questions and then I'll circle back to, I, I know Kim Lampert has her hand up and others might have. Sorry, I saw Councilor Labarge too. Oh, okay. I didn't see that. Okay. Uh, well, okay. Well, I'll just um, ask my question. So if there was, um, if, if we purchased the land and you, we don't have a design, you know, we don't have a very specified design of the building. If there was some, if you, if you found there was a problem, you couldn't put the facility there, but had purchased the land. Is that a scenario? And, and we would, I'm just I mean, curious. you know, like, things are always possible. Yeah. We, you know, David Pomerantz, before he retired, um, <laughs> you know, hired Berkshire Design for initial feasibility, that go, no go. And yeah. both David and I felt like we ruled out the things which would kill a project. Okay. Um, not that we could never be wrong, but I think we did a pretty careful due diligence. Right. Um, okay. And so the part of the vision here, um, is really a dual use. That's correct. correct. So do people park there? Kind of, so people are parking there just kind of haphazardly. And, yeah, okay, so that's happening. Um, yeah, and I guess I wonder um, what, how the residents um, feel about, about that, that part of the use. Is that a benefit? I mean, what I'm hearing is that there's dogs there, frankly, anyway. <laughs> kind of walking back and forth. I'm just trying to really visualize this dual use space and whether there would be, you know, any benefits to the residents around there or, or we could work with the residents to, you know, if they want, I don't know, signage or, you know, thing, if, if there's things that they desire in their own use of that space, we could work with, um, you know, the immediate uh, residents mm -hmm. so that they felt like, you know, it was, kind of addressing some things that they want on their, their wish list. So that's yeah. one thing I was thinking. Yes, you're absolutely right. And that would ask be part of our plan. Um, so using parking for an example, when we did the first site visit, most residents wanted more parking because they thought there'd be spillover on the streets if we didn't have more parking. Oh, one neighborhood wanted less park, one neighbor wanted less parking because she thought it would discourage people. That's the decision we don't have strong feelings about. So we would engage the neighborhood in that kind of design. Signage, all those things, frankly, are relatively easy and we like working with neighborhood. You know, Broad Brook Coalition has asked us to fix the gate. It's not in very good shape and the pothole. So all those things are things we do. Understandably, and this is the normal process, if you're a neighborhood who's saying, we don't want anything to happen, which I understand why they do that, it's hard to have those sort of detailed conversations. Mm, so right. we tend to go back later. This is again, what we did on Laurel Street and Councilor, you were involved with Evergreen, sort of a similar process, you know, sort of we, once we know we're doing, an Evergreen's a good example. Once we know we're doing, you know, one or two affordable units there, then we went to the neighborhood and neighborhoods had some criteria they wanted us were happy to follow, but we didn't ask them up front, you know, do you want anything? Because everyone right. doesn't want anything. Right. So we, we would go it. back to neighborhood and engage them and say, how many parking spots should you do? Sign so it. that's the plan that you would go back to the residents? Because frankly, I mean, we have some here, but I can't guess, you know, that's interesting. Um, right. I mean, they don't need to park because they live there, but perhaps, yeah, cars are, are parking them in. or So there's things that they will know that we don't in terms of what would. And I, I don't, I've never, I had never really been up there. And I don't know how well kept the paths are or if that's something the residents could you know, benefit from, I don't know. Um, it's a beautiful spot. I see, <laughs> see why it's, I see why that residents feel passionately about where they live. And I've really appreciated the tenor of the, the, the emails we've been getting and very thoughtful. Um, and clearly a lot of time has been into petitions and I, I really appreciate the tenor of the conversation. And I think their fears are reasonable. I mean, I, I would have the same fears. I think that, I mean, they're reasonable. That makes sense to me. I mean, I, you know, and I don't think it's a done deal. I'm, um, you know, what I know and what in terms of I'm just going to share how I'm feeling about this is um, I felt strongly that we do need a facility in Northampton. I just, you know, I went through the process with the, the site that we didn't go with um, in Ward 2. And, uh, and within that process, we learned a lot about why, why a facility in Northampton was beneficial. I think the carbon footprint uh, is one issue, you know, having the cart, you know, haul animals and 
Um, I don't think it's a very good use of our animal control officer's time. They're already strapped and um, spending, you know, hours in the car a week is not how I'd like to. Um, what's, you know, what you brought up the other day, Director, about um, climate change. And, you know, we just don't know what's ahead in terms of, you know, intense weather and what that means for, you know, animals. I also, we're not a tiny community, you know, 28,000 of us. and. This would be interesting stats. Um, but, you know, I think we're particular uh, animal lovers here. I think we have a lot of pet cohabitators, which means we have animals getting off leashes more often. I, I don't have that data, but um, that's the feeling I get that we do care about, you know, animals. Um, I know when I lost my cat, I would have loved to have a facility right here in town and not have to call, you know, Springfield and, you know, uh, that kind of thing, but think that there might be a place, a more central place. So I'm very committed to us having this facility. Um, I also think it, um, yeah, I just, I think it is a, a really unique uh, patch of land and I would like us, you know, I, I'd like the city to acquire it. And, and beyond that, I'm really just thinking about the location, you know, that's it. You know, um, that's why I don't think it's a Dundee, you know, I was really just questioning and really trying to sit with the actual location, knowing that we don't have a perfect location that we've gone through this a few times um but i am committed to the facility and um you know i think you know i wish yeah i wish there was that that location that was really far from residents and then i would just be like so excited and um i'm still thinking about about it i mean um the dual use i think is really interesting and um yeah, those are my thoughts. I, I think, you know, and um, yeah, Mayor. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off. Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. Those thoughts. Um, you know, something I brought up the other night that sort of you, you've mentioned something along these lines, and this might not make me very popular with people who like to take their dog off leash in uh, at the Fitzgerald Lake area. So I apologize. Um, as they know, dogs are supposed to be leashed. Um, but, you know, the Broadbrook Coalition, this has been something that has been a real struggle for them for a long time. And they continually talk about, um, about the damage to trails and the dangers of having dogs off leash there and, and have many, many times asked for more animal control in that area. So, you know, I just, I feel like that this is sort of an added benefit too, is that um, there, you know, there's potential for more regulation. And again, I'm sorry to all the people who really enjoy that for their dogs. Um, but, you know, having the dogs on those trails um, is disruptive to wildlife. It causes other damage. Wayne, you can probably speak to this better. Um, but this is something that I've heard many, many times from them is, is a considerable problem. So, um, and, and they would like more more help from us and we've certainly never been able to offer it. Um, so, you know, this this could be potentially an added benefit for for, for that sort of significant problem. Oh. Um, can I also just, before Wayne, I know I sort of asked you to weigh in and then let me just, I just wanna also just say one other thing, which is, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear people say that they haven't felt heard about this or aren't feeling heard in this process, you know, if, if you've sort of never been part of one of these processes before, it's, uh, I'm sure it's jarring and, and different, um, but this is the process and we are hearing you, you know, uh, many of you, I, I know that um, you've been in touch with the mayor's office there, you know, Chris in particular, I know you've had many conversations with the mayor's office. Um, you know, we are hearing you and, and I don't want to ever speak for the council, although as I was a counselor, so I still feel very attached to it. But the council hears people, and you know this is this is what this is this process. We are listening to you. If if we if all of us weren't listening to you, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We wouldn't go through these different times where we're um, soliciting public comment or having public comment and and having this sort of continual discussion about this. But um, you know it 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 makes me sad that people feel like they're not being listened to. Um, because they definitely are, you know, we we all have been spending a great deal of time uh, fielding information from people, hearing them, answering calls, answering emails, um, and again, this is this is what this is. You are you're talking to us, and we are and we are 
trying to respond to your concerns. So um, again, I'm, I'm sorry if that's how it, uh, people have felt, but please rest assured that we are all listening to you. And that's why we're, we're here right now having this conversation. Oh, thank you for that, Mayor. I just gonna, I'm just going i going to ask one more um, question that was asked of me that I don't, can't really answer, and then I will open it um, up for any kind of questions or comments from um, our resident um, guests. Um, so I just want to own, and this, you know, Northampton, we're just part of a larger society here, but I'm going to own that, you know, what um, Adrian, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, uh, was uh, was talking about earlier, that there there is a person or people who appear to be living in a tent there, and we're making a nice controlled facility for animals. And that that kind of, you know, that that brings up a lot about living in our in our country. And it's just there. And I'm not saying that we have to, you know, can solve all that. And I know that we are um, looking at ways to uh, address um, houselessness and um, housing insecurity, um, and we have particularly engaged community that way. Um, but yeah, I, I think we need to own that. that that's, there's, a, there's something there and it's not comfortable and it's food for thought. Um, and that just leads to my question that someone asked me, which was, did you, you said, Wayne, that, you, that we had looked at just the Moose Lodge for a decade. Was it ever considered for affordable housing or attainable housing? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's how we started this. So it wasn't, okay. it, it was, um, we have had an informal pledge through four mayors of providing all the lots that Habitat for Humanity can absorb. Um, we tend to do rental apartments in places with density and buses. So downtown Florence State Hospital. So it's not really a place we want rental, you know, with high populations, but we looked at it for Habitat, couldn't reach an agreement on price and then move forward and use the same funding we have to buy land elsewhere. Um, we have now given, or in the process of giving, Habitat enough lots to keep them busy for three or four or five years. Yeah. So we are under less pressure to find new lots for them. We will be at some point, they're gonna use that inventory. But we're, we have a lot of lots that, thanks to city council, we've surplus a lot of formal parcels. So yes, that's how we started. That's not currently our plan. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so I'm going to open up the floor, and uh, you know the um, mayor and director, you, you're welcome, you know, to stay as long as you want. But we also understand if if you cannot. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Labarge, and then I'll, I'll move thank on you. to the rest. Of I'll just do it very quick. Yeah, I sorry. want to yeah. thank the mayor um, for bringing up about the dogs being unleashed because that was a serious issue. Hearing that, and also. People who are feeling they're not being heard. I'm hearing it all the time. I got calls again today from people in that area of feeling that they're bringing out what their concerns are, what they would like to see in that area, which was exactly what Councilor Maiori talked about, putting a house there, whatever, for affordable housing, if not under conservation, Broadbrook, step in, help out with that area. So I want to thank you, Mayor, for bringing up some of these issues and also Councilor Mayor, which was very important for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Bard. Also, Barton. also oh, living yeah. in the tents, that was another one that was brought up in that first meeting on that Saturday of people living in the tents. So thank you, Councilor Mayor, I'm bringing that up too. Right. And, you know, you, you brought up a good point, Councillor, that it was, I will just also name and own that it was awkward at the um, experiment because councillors actually were not supposed to deliberate with residents. So it was kind of hard, at, you know, didn't want to start a conversation and then run away. So um, that that was just a, a unique, you know, kind of a unique situation where councillors were all together and uh, we really weren't supposed to be deliberating. So it, it did feel a little... Um, you know, not as friendly as we usually are with our residents. So anyway, um, okay. So we'll we'll hear from some residents, and then the committee members will all then uh, deliberate and discuss. Um, yeah, Kim Kim Lambert, you had your hand up first. Yeah, can you hear Hi. me? Yeah. Okay. A question or well, a I I forgot to mention that um, I was at the sound uh, test, and left out of the testing results um, is the loud sound of responding barking dogs that will be in the Moose Lodge parking lot. 
they're going to join the dogs barking in the kennel. And from sunrise to sunset, if a door closes, we're going to hear reactive barking from the dogs. So we don't have an accurate sound test because we don't know what the sound will be like and how loud it will be of how many dogs in the parking lot will be barking in response to the little barks they hear inside the building. The other thing is, I think, I think Council Maori, you said people care a lot about their animals and that they keep their dogs off leash when they care a lot about animals. You didn't say it exactly like that, but <laughs> something like that it shows that they love their animals. But I don't think that's synonymous with loving your animals. In fact, you know, I live in this area and I had to stop walking on Broadbrook uh, Path because dogs are off leash there all the time. And it's such a problem. It's, a, it's an extreme problem. And Mayor, I'm sorry, but if the um, animal control officer and the city was going to support the animal control officer to do something, they would have done it by now. I really don't understand why nothing has been done by now. I walked down there for the first time a few days ago and a dog off leash jumped on me. Before it had a chance to jump on me, I asked the off leash owner to call the dog, to put the dog on a leash. And the person just ignored me. When I used to walk down there, I would talk to people about their dogs off leash and they're belligerent. They're downright belligerent. And they say, everyone else does it. I'm going to do it too. Um, that's that whole education piece that the BBC is trying to do with the public. You know, they're, they need the support of the city. And the city's got to start acting on that. It's a, it's a huge problem down there. It's, it's a useless place, really, because you can't walk there without dogs off leash barking at you or jumping on you. Um, and in terms of the parking, the more parking you provide, I'm not saying we shouldn't provide some more parking, but the more parking you provide, the more dogs off leash we're going to have the more problems we're gonna have with people that think it's their right to let their dogs run off leash in land that's protected for the creatures that live there. It's very frustrating to see that happening and the city doing nothing. Um, I have a question about if that land is privately owned, the person who, the people who own it do they have the right to ask this police to ask the people who are tenting there on that five acres to leave? And I just noticed the other day that there is a lot of trash there. There was, there was firewood piled up. I don't know. I didn't get in and get a look at to see if people are using firewood to warm themselves or to eat. I'm sorry that they're feeling the need to live there. I think it's probably safer there than in a shelter. But if there's pri if it's privately owned, can the police go and remove them? Versus if the public owns it, Mayor, would you be against the police going up and asking those people to leave? Um, well, so, can I just, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mayor. Oh, and I, and I just wanted to lastly say, I am keeping track of the parking up there. After a snowfall, there are occasions when people park on Pines Edge Drive and Cook Ave. Um, signage was put at the end of Emily Lane on Cook Ave when it became a problem for their getting into and out of Emily Lane. This is maybe 20 years ago. There's no reason why we couldn't have signage on at the end of our street and on Cook Ave, no parking allowed and have the city ticket. We don't need to be concerned about that and expand the parking just for that reason. It's a very rare occasion after a snowfall, if the DPW does not plow that parking lot, it's a very rare occasion that people park on Pines Edge Drive and on Cook Ave. And that's the skiers that park there. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Kim. I just wanted to um, apologize if I gave the impression that I was uh, pro dogs off leashes. I, I, did, uh, I think our dogs should be leash and follow the and follow the, the, our, our ordinances here in Northampton. So, um, yes, um, Mayor, did you? Yeah, or, I was just, yeah, I mean, if, yeah. if land is privately owned, then obviously the, the landowner can, can do what they want with that land. Um, you know, if, if the city owned it, you know, we, um, we know that some people are seeking shelter in tents and particularly in the winter, um, if that's the shelter that they feel that they can use, um, you know, we try and be very sensitive about that. Um, so, you know, if we, we don't want to have unsafe situations, but we also don't want to um, take any kind of shelter from somebody if, if that's um, if that's what is you know what is keeping them uh, alive at the moment and and is the situation that you know if we have lots of conversations about people who uh, can't necessarily access congregate shelter for some reason it doesn't work for them um, so this is this is a, a city problem it's a nationwide problem. Um, and it's something that we're very, we try to be very sensitive about and, um, and make sure that we are not, um, not kicking people out if that's a place where they need to be and there's people then move to somewhere else. So, you know, uh, if, if situations are unsafe, we, um, we try and step in and make them as safe as possible, but we also try to be really sensitive to human need as much as we can. And, um, and always try and get people into more secure housing. Um, but for some people, that's not really something that they're compatible with at certain times. And so we try and be really sensitive. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I understand that. But those tents behind the Moose Lodge are just, have just been there for about two or three weeks, directly behind the Moose Lodge. And I want to know about the piles of wood what the city would do concerning potential for fire. You know, I don't, so we don't own that land. Um, you know, I don't know uh, if Wayne's been in touch with the landowners, he could ask um, what they know about that situation, but um, you know, that's, it's not, it's not something I have any information about right now. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you, Kim. Um, let's see, we have Alice and then, Councilor Jarrett. Hi, Alice, do you have a question or a comment? Yes, my name is Alice Slazik and I live on Emily Lane. Um, and I am probably the closest house on Emily Lane to the Moose Lodge property. My property backs right up to it. And I am actually very much in favor of this um, purchase because I would love to see that land own publicly rather than privately. And I agree that it would be nice if it could be used as conservation land, but from what Dr. Fiden has mentioned, it looks like that's not gonna be a possibility. And I think that if we use it as an animal control facility and if it's well built um, with everyone's considerations in mind, given that um, all of the comments that people have brought up, other neighbors, um, concerns about the noise, et cetera. But I think it, it, it is actually a very good use of that property. And it, I know it sounds like a lot of money, the $750,000 for a facility that's not gonna be used very often. But from what I'm hearing is that for years, um, the council, city council has been looking for a place that it really is needed. And I think, you know, over the years, the price has probably gone up from um, what it was years ago. And I think that's just the cost of what it is. And I think that the council should take that into consideration. And um, have, after having looked, looking for so long, if this is really a place that's appropriate, then go ahead and do it. Um, and then as the, the added benefit of having the, the parking for um, Fitzgerald Lake area, because I use that conservation a lot. Um, and I agree that the parking could be a, um, a benefit to the whole community. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Mayor. Sorry, um, no thank problem. you uh, for those comments. Of course, I'm grateful for them. Um, 
it's sort of along those lines, you know, something that we we mentioned at the last meeting but haven't talked about tonight is we um, in our presentation we gave a few examples of other municipal um, or municipally used facilities, animal control facilities that are in residential neighborhoods in the Commonwealth, um, and actually that are um, closer, significantly closer to the residences than this one is proposed to be. Um, and I just, you know, I, I, I hope this makes residents feel better. I understand, you know, I, again, I'm sorry that people don't feel heard. I, I hope you feel more heard after this evening. Um, and, you know, like I think Councilor Maori was saying, like, I, I understand that this is, I, I can see why this would be concerning, but I, you know, we are, we're trying to answer your concerns and make sure you know that we will do everything possible to mitigate any sound. Um, so that was a whole preamble to say that um, I hope this would be comforting to know that, you know, we've talked to those facilities who are closer to residences than what this is proposed to be. And they don't, they have not experienced sound complaints. Um, so they've sort of coexisted in these, re in these residential neighborhoods um, with, without complaint from residences. And so um, this certainly is something that can be done and has been done elsewhere. Um, so I, I just hope that makes the neighborhood feel better that, um, you know, we, we could certainly achieve this and we'll be happy to work with them to achieve that. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, let's see, Councillor Garrett. Thank you, Councillor Mayori. Um, this has been great to listen in on. Um, I am uh, Alex Jarrett. Uh, I live uh, in Florence and I'm the counselor for Ward 5. Um, I certainly found the sound test yesterday to be useful, um, though I do understand there are additional variables, but the sound test at 65 decibels um, was almost inaudible from, from where we were standing. And that wasn't at the level of the full soundproofing measures, though. Certainly the question of dogs barking in response is a consideration. Um, my question uh, has to do with um, the finances, which I'm still trying to get a full grasp of. Um, one is that the building, um, how do we, you know, when we look at the life cycle of a building, are we thinking of, you know, 30 years, um, and if we look at it as, as how we might amortize a building over 30 years, um, <clears throat> we're looking at a yearly cost. And then comparing that to um, kind of the number of animals and the current costs and staff time and what we pay for other facilities, I understand that it will be more um, to have our own facility, I believe. I mean, perhaps, perhaps I'm wrong there, but um, I think it would be helpful to have those, all those different costs laid out so that we can weigh these considerations and the costs uh, over the long term, you know, understanding that there will be a benefit to the um, animals to be cared for better, um, but then a weigh that uh, against the costs and the, the staff time and all that. So I, I would appreciate maybe for Thursday's meeting um, a little bit more of a sense of our current costs and um, our current our animal populations that we're we're taking care of um and um i did look up the property on the uh in massachusetts interactive property map and it looks like it's it says it's 3.07 acres well thank you thank you council jared um okay let's see oh councilor Moulton. Thank you. Um, to follow up on Councillor Jarrett's uh, direction on costs, I, wa I wanted to ask the mayor, what was spent on animal control uh, during the last fiscal year? And what do you anticipate budgeting for animal control with this new facility uh, if it's approved in the next fiscal year? Um, so in FY21, um, the ACO expenditures, um, so supplies and equipment, um, this isn't of course including uh, uh, personnel costs, um, were, it was $23,268. Um, so- How much, Mayor? Uh, $23,268. Thank you. Um, so there wouldn't be significant additional cost for running this building. 
Um, and, you know, again, the, the council has already approved this, you know, the expenditure for this building um, in two different, uh, you know, in, in 2018 and then in 2021. So that's not sort of, that's not a question that's, that's on the floor. The question is the purchasing of this land. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'd be happy to have us work up some numbers, but that, that, that amount has already been appropriated. Yes, I, under, I understand that the capital expense has been appropriated. I'm, I'm asking specifically about the operating budget. Uh, you said there would not be a, a uh, significant additional cost. I'm wondering if there would be a savings from the uh, reduction in, in travel. That's a good question. Um, we could try and figure that out. I mean, certainly there would be um, less, less uh, gas used and less wear and tear on the vehicles. Um, you know, sort of traveling all around. Um, so there, there would be some savings to that. And, and the, the plan then would be to have the ACOs work out of that facility be, that's their headquarters, yeah. and they would staff it. What, what would you anticipate the number of hours per week that they would be, be physically on site? I could get better numbers for you for Thursday. Um, you know, right now we have um, one of our ACOs is on maternity leave, so it's a little bit hard to calculate. Um, and then we have a part-time ACO. So once it was back to being fully staffed, um, I, you know, I could try and get uh, a number for you on that. And then, you know, and sometimes they're working um, simultaneously, but it's sort of in different areas. So, you know, they're, they're picking up animals or dealing with animals and so, um, you know, they they are out and around throughout the city because that's what their job is, is to. Yes, I understand that. I think it would be helpful to know what the number of hours roughly of on-site staffing there would be to help address Council Labarge's question about uh, sudden illnesses, uh, uh, you know, and how many hours a, a week uh, they would, the dogs, uh, the animals would be unattended. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, again, I'll get that for you. I, my understanding, you know, I think at overnight, which is standard for any of these facilities, um, but during the day, there would be staff there or staff coming in and out and attending to them. Okay, um, Councilor Labarge? Yes, Mayor, question please. Now with, um, the dog control officer, Shelley, and like I said in her website, and somebody had called me today about it, that she is the dog control officer for Williamsburg. So my question is, if she is, does she use our city vehicle, no. is it her own vehicle or our city vehicle that she uses? And is she getting paid by the city for picking up the dogs in Williamsburg or bringing them to Northampton? No, I mean, so I believe she works part time um, for Williamsburg, but that's on her own time. On her own time. Okay, thank you. Uh, could, could anyone who's not speaking mute your microphone? We're getting a little reverb. Maybe I'll do it. Oh, seemed to work. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> um, Councilor Barnes, were you finished? I'm finished. Thank okay. you. Uh, so I, I see Tracy has her hand up. And then after that, we, you know, if I, for the time, I would like to start wrapping up and having the committee members uh, have a discussion. Um, and just to also remind um, uh, residents that we'll but full, at full city council on Thursday, there'll be public comment. What's nice about these subcommittees is we, we can have a little bit more back and forth. So it will just be the same type of full council public comment where there won't be that interaction, but just, just to let you know that. But Tracy, why don't you go ahead and your question and your comment? Um, I have two questions actually that I'd love to have answered. And the first one is, um, do you know as the finance committee what the annual cost will be to maintain this facility? And if you do, um, will those costs be subsidized by the taxpayers? Um, 
And if not, where will the income come from to subsidize the costs? My second question is to the mayor. Um, you mentioned two or more animal control facilities that you found that are even closer to residents' homes. Um, I'd like to know where those facilities are exactly. Thank you. So um, Marblehead, Swansea, and Brockton are the ones that we um, highlighted in our presentation. I know that there are some others, but those were the three I was talking about. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Mayor or Director Fiden, would you like to address the maintenance cost? I feel, I feel like you did answer that earlier, correct? I I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 yeah. Did. Well, you did. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Right, so, you know, in FY20, it was uh, 27,250. All right, that was it. In 21, 22,268. Um, uh, and then, you know, we, we spend a certain amount of money um, per year on the contract with Amherst when we have it, when they are willing to give it to us. Again, it has kind of gone back and forth. Sometimes they don't. Um, and then there's a per night fee at, uh, at Amherst as well um, of $15 a dog. So um, those are some, some of the other costs, but the, the sort of general expenditure costs are the other ones that I've given. I was actually asking what the cost will be to maintain the new facility for all the costs and oh. will that cost be um, subsidized by the taxpayers? I don't see an income. So, I mean, it's a city building, so. Um, it would, you know, it would be in the city budget. Um, so, you know, I get, there would be some, um, so we would make this as energy efficient a building as possible. I don't and Wayne can probably speak to that more maybe, um, but, you know, there would be some electricity and, and, um, and heating costs and cooling costs. So does the finance committee know how much those costs would be annually? We, we do not. Um, the the building, we don't have the building yet. So I, I don't know that that's available right now. We just know the cost of this land and what we've already approved for the facility. Um, let's see, I would, uh, I would ideally like the, um, the mayor and director to be able to go about their lives. So if I would say if, um, if, if committee members had any last questions for them, I, do. I mean, you're welcome to hang up, but I was just thinking you could answer them and then we, the committee members could uh, discuss them. And yes, Council Labarge. Yes, Mayor, is there some way you could get some data? I would like to know from the years of 2020, 2021, how many dogs, seven days a week throughout the year that we've had that were sent out to Amherst or the hotel or how many dogs at the police station. That is very, very helpful here of how many dogs a week, seven days a week throughout the whole year. Um, Thank you. Uh, Councilor Barge, I, I, that would be interesting to know. And I just, I don't know how this would impact it, but those were pandemic years. So I just, I know. I'd be curious. I'm just wondering if that's like, you know, there's less um, stray dogs run, running around because you're your <laughs> eyes on, it'll be interesting. I don't know, but I just want to- No, but there's a lot those, of chipmunks. <laughs> yeah, that those years might just not be, the, they may or may not be represented. Yeah. Um, I will, I'll do my best to get some numbers. You know, I think we've said we've, we've struggled yeah. to keep data the last few years, particularly with um, sort of the changing situation and that we sort of have animals stashed everywhere. Like we're, we're being really open about this. Um, I, you know, I do have a little bit better data for um, 2015, 2016 and 2017. So I certainly can provide that. I'll do that. That's fine. Okay. Well, Thank we'll you. have that available. Thanks. Okay, um, committee members, uh, any further um, questions for mayor or the, the director? If not, um, 
thank you so much for your time that we, you know, that was a very thorough discussion. I really appreciate it. It was great to have you here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Good night. Let's see. I'm going to. Councillor Nash. Okay. Close. Okay. Oh, yes. Councillor Nash. Thank you, Councillor Mayori. So, um, so I am, I, I'm sensing that uh, a number of, of, of counselors here are waiting or, or hoping to get a little more data to um, make a decision. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I am personally at a place where I would be um, comfortable of voting for a positive recommendation, but I am going to make a motion uh, to uh, send this forward with a neutral recommendation with the idea that um, there that counselors are anticipating a little more information from the mayor to uh, land on a decision. I just want I want to say why I'm comfortable moving forward. I as a counselor, I've already voted twice on approving funding for this this facility um, that on numerous occasions, I, 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 may, I had communications with the previous mayor as to, I am happy to work with you to find a location in Ward 3. Um, and that, um, and I, I am very much committed to seeing this facility be built. This facility is about caring for animals, that these are animals that are lost. Uh, they could be on a stray on a street, in somebody's backyard, up a tree. Um, we have an animal control officer goes out and gets these animals and bring it and needs to bring them somewhere while they we go through the process of trying to figure out who the owners are and, and how to care for it, how to return these animals back to their homes. Um, I, I just want to say that of uh, I have great uh, sympathy for our animal control officer. Uh, I. I would say that uh, concerns about animals, probably especially dogs, are the number one, are, are the number three thing that I get in my emails and communications with people. That uh, we have, uh, you know, dogs that bark, dogs that are off leash, dogs that bite, uh, poop, or eat, or <laughs> chew on all sorts of things. And our ACO is out there getting in the middle of all of this and that um and, and it's a very difficult job and that um and that one of the things i really appreciate about having this facility in in town is that is that our acl will be here and not over in hadley or amherst or out in west hampton that they'll actually be here in town you know 10 five minutes maybe 15 minutes away but not a half hour or potentially 40 to 45 minutes because they're already heading that way. And now they got to complete their trip and then come all the way back. Um, I, I think that um, having this, this shelter in our community, I think there's going to be a lot of support for it. That, uh, that I, I think people are going to want to step up and, um, and be part of making this a success. Um, that, um, that, People in this community really care about their animals, oh, yeah. and and it, it's an important thing for all of us. As Councillor Labar uh, Labarge was sharing, you know that we all have a passion. Um, so I I I'm pretty I'm I'm ready to to vote for this, and and but I I I'm, I'm okay with 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 doing a neutral recommendation here while we 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 get a little more information. But I, I just wanted to make my thoughts clear on this. So can I get a second for that? Yes, I second uh, your motion uh, and I'll speak to it, uh, President Nash. I appreciate your sensitivity to the fact that several of us have asked for additional data. And I think we want to have as much hard data as we can Thursday night before we ultimately vote on this. Um, I also want to echo, echo what the mayor said. As the ward counselor, I've listened uh, very carefully for many hours to uh, residents uh, speak uh, uh, about their concerns in the neighborhood, 
and I've, I've, I've taken that very seriously at the, uh, at the uh, initial meeting that we had on February 12th. We arranged for another site visit, which was attended by eight counselors yesterday. We've had a robust discussion now for a couple of hours uh, tonight. Uh, and I, 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 I do want to acknowledge the fact that we got a petition uh, yesterday. Each of us was handed a copy of it. Um, I have heard now from uh, uh, 41 uh, different people, 24 opposed, 17 in favor. I make that 42. I got one more in favor today. Uh, and then the petition yesterday has already been said was overwhelmingly um, opposed to the uh, to the facility that added 28 new names to the uh, 24 people who had already contacted me. So, yes, I've heard strong uh, concerns expressed by many, many people in the neighborhood. Uh, uh, most of the immediate neighbors have have a lot of quality of life concerns. And I think it's not just. The, the animal control facility and the potential noise, but also uh, I think we need to be very sensitive to uh, concerns about traffic in that neighborhood mm -hmm. and uh, parking. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs to be considered very carefully as, as, as well. In terms of the facility, again, to echo President Nash, we, we're talking about a, we're talking about lost pets and, and pets by definition belong in people's homes. Uh, and and this is a this is a modest shelter that is a safe haven for a, a, a very limited amount of time for pets who have been separated from their from their owners. And I, I I'm sensitive to the concerns of, of neighbors, but I I don't think that this facility, which is not a commercial kennel. I would feel differently about a commercial kennel. Yeah. Automatically doesn't belong in a, in a residential neighborhood. Pets are part of, of residences, dogs. So uh, I, um, I've heard the concerns and I've considered this, this very, very carefully. And I, I uh, will await further data on Thursday before we, um, before we vote on it. Okay, so we, excuse me, we have a motion on the floor. Any more comments? Okay, uh, Laura, would you please just a roll call? Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Thank you, and I did what I, I didn't do what I've always, asking President Nash to do, which is repeat the motion. So the motion was a neutral recommendation to full council um, on Thursday, um, mainly pending you know, this um, new data that's been asked for. So uh, thank you very much. Um, we're, going to, we're going to switch gears here. Um, I want to check in with my committee members. You know, so uh, yeah. So we have the scope and the responsibilities of uh, the finance committee next. And I put that on there um, to remind us that that was something we wanted to and to you know discuss. And if we, if we had time to discuss, um, I'm feeling pretty fatigued by our meeting. Um, if we could just, we could um, certainly have some sort of discussion. Um, another, you know, we could take a break and have a discussion. We could have a short discussion. Um, or we can um, just make sure that we put this on a, a, another agenda coming soon. Yes. I President would Nash. like to put it on to another agenda, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, President Nash. I, I, I concur with uh, Councilor LaBarge. You know, let's, uh, you know, we're, we're probably due for another finance meeting in the next week or so. We can yeah. schedule that and um, and and do that when when we're we're fresh. Yeah, right. I I mean the reason that um, I want we we should do it soon, um, as Councilor Moulton reminded me, is of course if this want we want this to be pertinent to the budget season. And that's gonna I concur. But we'll check in about that. I, I don't. Yeah. How about yes, Councilor Moulton? Yeah, that's that's fine. And in okay. fact, I mean, we normally we would meet next Tuesday anyway, so we might. Uh, we might take that up uh, on the 8th. Yes, yes. Um, 
Okay, so we're going to put that on other, in, new, in terms of new business, I will put on the next agenda, um, I'll work with Laura to establish, uh, you know, um, routine meetings. We, we wanted to look at Monday holidays to make sure we weren't meeting um, the Tuesday after a Monday holiday that happened last time, because that means that we um, have to put the agenda before um, well, council has referred us to anything that Thursday. Anyway, so new business might, um, I'm just reminding myself that we're going to, um, we'll, we'll look at having a regularly, regularly scheduled meetings. Um, and I'll put that on the agenda. Uh, yes, Councilor Lombard. Yes, I just heard, I think Councilor Moulton mentioned March 8th. What is that for? Um, well, well, I, I, I think normally our, 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 I mean, Council Mayor was just referring to a, a, a establishing a regular schedule. But what we've established so far is that we're meeting on the Tuesday after a City Council uh, meeting, if anything has been referred to the uh, to the Finance Committee. Right. Which we had talked about the fourth week on a Tuesday. Right. That's what was said. Um, okay, well, I think it's, um, I think we, 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 we will wait till Thursday to see if what's referred to us. Um, and then we can, um, you know, if there's nothing referred to us, then we can make a decision not to meet um, that Tuesday. But um, I think um, Laura and I should um, sit down with a calendar and with your um, with your limitations, uh, Council of Arts, uh, in mind when we make um, when we make a schedule. Yeah. Uh, just, just, yeah. just to clarify, Council LaBarge, we need to meet uh, anytime something's been referred to us, I we need to meet before that, the next uh, council meeting in I order to move business I along in a in a timely that. manner. I right. understand that. But I um, was told that it would either be the first or the fourth Tuesday. Then if something was critical, then we would make it critical to have it. So whatever. So Council Maori, that's all right. Great. We'll go over okay. this. Well, and also I think um, right. And we can also discuss, go back to the discussion if we need to of other days. Right. But um, why don't yeah? Why don't we? Um, that sounds like a plan. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> uh, any other? Yeah. Uh, so if there's no other discussion, yes, President Nash. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Hey, roll call, please, Laura. Come for me, Laura. Thanks. Come for me, Ori. Oh, yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you to our everyone who joined us tonight. Have a great night. You thank too. You too. Thank you.